Welcome to Immersive Espresso. Um, so this is the kickoff to our new series of mostly informal conversations um, just around rebooting Immersive kind of in the wake of pandemic and all the changes that we're all going through. Uh, so we plan on it running the gamut from kind of big picture thinking around what we all do um, down to resources and really practical tactics. Um, on that note of tonight being the first night, thank you for in advance for understanding of any possible tech issues going on. There's all the stuff that normally can happen, uh, of course, uh, with remote events. And then there's also the fact that it's 2 a.m. where I am. Um, and I haven't really spoken English in about a week, so <laughs> apologies in advance. Um, luckily, tonight you don't really have to be listening to me too much. Um, we are all super lucky to have Jason Shepard uh, and Tim Sack of Reactive and Archipelago and a range of other ventures here with us um, to be looking at space and what's changing in the real estate space um, that can impact you know, new possibilities and ways that we can be putting on immersive productions. Um, one quick note about immersive espresso as a whole, um, you know, these are gonna be quick and sort of focused conversations around different themes. Um, so I just urge to not take any one kind of in a vacuum uh, on its own. Um, there's a whole host of uh, different things that we're going to be looking at and working through, everything from changes in the urban space to kind of real estate um, and some of the more kind of stakeholder strategies like we're looking at tonight, um, some new safety precautions. Um, so we'll kind of get to all of those in turn. Um, but your questions, for something like what we're looking at tonight in space are welcome at any time in the chat. So most of you are probably Zoom experts by now, um, but if you do not see a chat on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, you can get to it from the bottom, kind of under the video, just press chat. Um, and you're welcome to include questions on there anytime um, or whatever other conversation as well. You might see polls pop up every so often too. You probably saw one when you came in. Those are totally optional, um, but just ways that we can all kind of get a pulse track on. Um, what people are doing and, and thinking and making um, in this area. So thank you uh, for being here. And I think with that, um, I'll pass it off to Tim and Jason to say a little bit, bit more about themselves. Um, these guys are placemakers, designers, entrepreneurs, investors. Um, so for looking at kind of all the mentions of space and stakeholders um, and the folks that we'll want to be thinking about, um, we're really excited to have this conversation with them this evening. So Tim, Jason. Thank you, Danny. So thank you guys for inviting us here. You've got a new Sorry, we talked about the tech issues and we, we went right off. Always happens. <laughs> um, so we've got two computers going and that's why we got some feedback there. So my name is Jason Shepard. Um, I'm co-founder of Reactive, um, kind of a serial entrepreneur and all of it really uh, stems from space and, and real estate. And so I started as a real estate investor about 12 years ago, buying a lot of distressed uh, single family residential and commercial. We own assets in four different states around the, uh, the country. And really all of our service-based businesses stem from how can we make the process as an investor better? How can we make the service-based businesses in property management and brokerage? How can we actually use space and community with Archipelago? So um, I've been very much on this journey of how do I invest into to real assets? And then how do I optimize those, not only for myself and my personal return, but for the, the greater community? My name is Tim. Um, I'm part of Jason here at Reactive. My background is in design and experience design. Um, started in interiors and moved into events and then moved back to interiors. And now with Reactive, I'm really looking over how are we activating the spaces that we have within our platform and how do we maximize the interactivity of those spaces as well as the functional usage of them, um, as well as the kickback for the investors and the payoff for how do we make them more efficient by using them more frequently instead of building more things how do we use the things that we have more efficiently yeah so and i'll give a kind of a brief intro on reactive and and you know we looked at the space and i looked at my own internal holdings and i realized just how much latency there was in my assets and uh, how much they can be further optimized so when a restaurant tour leaves one of our buildings 
you know, we have nine months to get that property released, to get a TI package as far as improvements. And, you know, commercial real estate just carried these really lumpy timelines. And it really could be streamlined and allow for more revenue from me as an owner's perspective. But also it was really hard for an entrepreneur entrepreneur or anyone to access commercial real estate. It's usually comes with a five-year lease personally guaranteed and a huge, huge balance sheet. So what we started realizing is not only could this be a win for me as an owner of, of real estate to make sure that I have less vacancy, more utility, um, and more revenue from my assets, but we also looked at it as how can this be a win for, for the entrepreneur and for people that said, I just want to try and pop up my concept for a week or a month or, or six months but I don't want to sign a five-year lease personally guaranteed that I'm going to do this one thing, um, you know, for a half a decade. So, you know, we started realizing that this was just a great win-win and we deployed reactive in November of last year. Um, so it's very, very new. We, we've moved from probably 30 listings to 150 listings, all specific in Denver Metro. That's our home base. Um, and we're very targeted to, to bring on new inventory, interesting spaces, vacancy, and then also link that to a very vibrant, artistic um, community here in, in Denver. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just share my screen so we can get a, a look at the Reactive platform. Yeah, I was gonna say, anyone following along at home as well, reactive.io um, too, you can take a look directly. Yeah, so I'm sharing here. Let me go full screen with this. Um, this is our homepage. Uh, as you can see, it's it's very much set up like a marketplace, like you're probably accustomed to using within an Airbnb or another rent, re online rental marketplace. You can you know go search by location, dates, the term that you're looking for, specific categories within the real estate space, um, and then each of these. I'm actually just going to go to uh, to the page. So here's the homepage, as you can see, um, as we built it out, it's really a searchable space. These are some of our featured listings. Um, you know, we can browse through what is available. We do a lot of, you know, meeting space, a lot of pop-up retail, um, you know, just really maximize the visible space. This is a photo studio that often is, is used for things other than photos. This, uh, the Evans School Auditorium is a great example. Um, we had actually looked at hosting this, this, this talk in this space initially um before all this happened but this is a prime example of how reactive is activating the spaces that aren't being used this is a school that's been vacant for almost 50 years and they are redeveloping it but that won't happen for probably a 12 months to 18 months so in that interim time they've given us the ability to use the space and run it out on a torture basis so let's get to that piece. So yes, we are we are all at home on our couches instead of in that space tonight um, from something that has happened in the last few months. Uh, as immersive creators, you know, a lot of us have experienced all kinds of changes um, that the pandemic has wrought on our industries. Can you share a little bit in yours? What what has it done to leasing, and particularly what new opportunities um, are there for folks who perhaps with limited budgets might need you know be wanting to activate? spaces or, or need even larger spaces perhaps than normal. Yeah, so um, so this post-COVID world, or still kind of in the middle of it, um, has a lot of different challenges and with challenges also comes opportunities. So, you know, first of all, no one knows the rules of engagement um, and they change on an hourly basis. So that makes it difficult for, for entrepreneurs and creators to understand what they're actually going to create. But what it has done from a macro level is it's really changed the dynamics between landlords and renters. And, you know, landlords for probably far too long have had all the power and all the rules and kind of forced the product offering of a long term lease. Um, and, and what this has kind of done is it's, it's expedited a bit of what's, what's been on the, on the horizon for commercial real estate, which is 
We need to offer a better product in commercial re real estate. We need to make it more accessible. We need to be fragmented. We need to promote more sharing and collaboration. So this is kind of expedited what um, the, the, the cure for the, the commercial ailment, which was uh, really identified by, by this downturn. So um, we are seeing a lot more options for owners that are now looking at their assets and some vacancy and saying, yeah, I wanted a five-year lease. I wanted $5,000 a month. But if you want to do something cool and creative in this vacant space and add some vibrancy to it, you know, pay me 500 bucks for a month and, and keep the space alive and vibrant and part of kind of the, the community. So this has been a really nice um, transition to kind of reset the power structure between the landlord and the tenant relationship and really promoted a lot more of this, this sharing and complementary use and it's changed a lot of, of people's um, like buying patterns and, and decision making. And, and we're all right now focused a lot more on local, a lot more on creative, a lot more in su supporting our own communities. So um, this has really kind of been a nice offering for the immersive community, entrepreneurs, artists to start kind of being able to, to add some value into commercial real estate. Are there kinds of properties that you've seen the most impacted or sort of the most, you know, likely kind of open to those kinds of thinking? I mean, you mentioned commercial, these other spaces that are struggling as well with the pandemic. But. Yeah, so, I mean, everyone here is probably reading headlines each day, whether it's a working space and WeWork or retail, you know, being dead because of Amazon and no one going into space. Obviously, restaurants are really struggling right now. I mean, restaurants operate in like a 5% net margin business. When you take out 50% occupancy for social distancing, that really hampers their, their revenue numbers. So, you know, we, um, we see a lot of, of issues and vacancy coming through big office spaces, uh, retail locations, fitness locations. Um, and we're going to see for the next 12 to 18 months, I anticipate seeing just a wave of vacancy, bankruptcies, foreclosures, and landlords starting to get really creative as far as how, how does my, my building and my ground floor start adding value to the rest of, of the asset. So we do already have one question um, out of our, our chat. So Nancy Smith is wondering about the permitting process to use space that's only temporary and bringing in the public for an immersive experience. Um, and Tracy has helpfully actually jumped in um, with her experience with you guys and also the fact that, you know, kind of going through existing space changes some of those challenges. Um, I think we will have an upcoming immersive espresso that deals to in mm. sort of public space. You don't need to. Those issues. You don't but, need to. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yep. So, um, so what did I, but you shouldn't be able to hear me now. A couple of elements on. Uh, <laughs> On you. So uh, a couple of elements as far as, you know, what permitting and use and excise looks like in individual locations. So that's that's regulated really at the, the municipal level. And each set city kind of has their own look as far as, you know, what's a pop up experience? When do I have to file for a change of use if I'm taking something from an office space and turning into a retail location that usually comes with a process that you're changing a use with a specific uh, municipality. What's different in a situation where it's a short-term activation, A, if you're staying within the use context, you don't really have to change that. B, if you're doing something for less than 90 days, it's usually kind of a guiding light for most municipalities. They don't look at that as like, you need to go through the process of, of permitting and changing the use. We're looking at that as a special event to where a special use in, in that, that case. So really doesn't trigger much of that. We're also seeing you know, and this is, is what's happening on, on a governance level almost everywhere is um, when people are kind of struggling, we start seeing a bit of the regulation being backburnered and people now being able to go and expand their patios because they, they need more space for food and beverage concepts or take, take away um, alcohol because they need to keep, to keep places alive. So I think we'll continue to see some of that right now for short term sub 90 day activations. Those aren't really uh, hindrances at the governance level as far as what owners want to see in all of those situations. You know, a GL policy is almost like mandatory and it is through our website that you at least start planning of obtaining one or have one. Almost every landlord is going to want to see that you have coverage. Fortunately for us in this tech, tech era, I can do a desktop underwrite 
on a GL policy for a million million dollars in about a five minute online application. How many people are gonna be there? What's the address? What's the state and what's the use? And they underwrite you and give you a GL policy. So um, items like that from an owner's perspective, I wanna make sure it's insured. I wanna make sure it's gonna be cleaned up. I wanna make sure it's not gonna be a, a, a huge party or outside of the use or my neighboring um, you know, spaces aren't gonna be impacted. But all of that really happens on reactive as you're having the conversation before the booking would start. GL is general liability policy right. is just kind of insurance. Great. Cool. And, and everything on our site from a pricing standpoint has all triple nets and utilities and all that's built into it. So this is unlike a traditional lease, it is a one, one precise price. Uh, yeah. there, there could be a cleaning fee, there could be a, a security deposit still, but you are not allowed to use utilities within our system. Are there, either on your side or I guess in general, just on short term rented space, are there typical restrictions or requirements kind of beyond what you would just talked through that creators should be aware of kind of before going into this process or as they're thinking about if it's right for them? Yeah, I think each owner has a kind of different use. Um, you know, even some retail buildings that are in a, a master community, almost like an HOA in a, in a residential community can have like some governance over what can be done in that space. Um, but what's great about commercial is, you know, we read about this, this issue for short-term activation on Airbnb for residential space. And, and that's primarily because your next door neighbor didn't sign up to be uh, living next to a hotel. They don't want people coming in each day and, uh, and, and taking over their, you know, their, their kind of quality of life. What's different in the commercial space is being zoned in a commercial district and having a commercial property. You're, you're engaging in commerce and having that anyway. So um, as far as the big you know, headline risks that you see in Airbnb and short-term rentals, those are really alleviated because we're playing within the same use context of commercial rather than residential. I would say one thing that we've seen just as we are trying to activate the spaces that's always a situation is, is liquor licenses, liquor laws. If you intend to serve drinks within an event, events specifically, um, that's one thing that is just navigatable at the, at the city level that you will need some sort of permit specifically if you're selling alcohol. There is some ways around that with charities or some ways with private events that are that, that is still doable, but that's always something. And then capacity is always something. You still have to abide by the fire department and how many people can be in a space at a certain time. Um, and that's just something that has to be handled by making sure fire extinguishers are there. Just general liability safety things, those will always exist. Yeah, and I, I think to follow up on the, the alcohol, I mean, alcohol has been such an easy button to generate revenue because people are saying, how can I actually make money with my experience? And really that's, you know, we, we all realize that you can charge a pretty penny for that. And, and that's how a lot of rev revenue is generated. But unfortunately, I think that's just the easy button for most people that were hosting a gathering or creating an experience is that's how I can generate revenue. And what we're going to present, you know, later tonight through some of the activations that we've seen or people that have kind of taken on this persona of a placemaker is there's other ways to generate revenue outside of just selling booze or trying to figure out the booze situation. So even in Archipelago, which is a social community that I helped co-found here in Denver, I mean, we, we never have alcohol at our events. It's BYOB. We don't charge for, for it. Sometimes it's stocked, but it's really not the pop primary revenue driver. And I, you know, hopefully we can give you guys some tools to um, reduce the overhead expense as far as your spend on a space and find creative ways to find ancillary revenue rather than it just being through alcohol sales. There's a ton there that I want to pick up threads on. Uh, I want to throw out these two couple questions we got in the meantime. I think they're both pretty quick. Um, one from Betsy, do you have a particular company that you would recommend for a geo policy um, if some, you know, if <clears throat> presumably they're, you know, a production company or something is kind of wanting one in general beyond just an individual space. Um, well, we'll do that one first and then the question from Lonnie. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, send it over, but I think it's called the eventhelper.com. So Tim will, will share that with everyone, but very quick underwriting process. Um, Just and put it, it in the chat, yeah. Yeah, so it's in the chat there. Um, and it makes it easy because that's, that's probably one of the primary objections for most most landlords and most owners is I just want to make sure someone is covered in, in, uh, in insurance. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, and then a question from Lonnie, do you have any outdoor spaces in your collection um, or right. other kinds of unusual urban space? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously outdoor spaces on demand right now. And we're, um, we're reaching out to a lot of adjacent um, patio spaces to restaurants because they need the floor space. And sometimes it's, it's sharing with the, you know, the coffee shop that doesn't really use their patio at night, but the bar needs it at night. So, you know, how can we be more collaborative and, and utilize the space in a better, better way? So we're bringing on listings every single day. I think we brought on three listings today. Um, lots of larger outdoor venues, lots of larger venues, just in case, um, you know, social distancing and um, those types of factors play into even indoor space. So um, we continue to add those on a daily basis. And, and yes, we, we, we know that they're on demand for a reason. Yeah, even before COVID, we were onboarding rooftop spaces that a lot of people don't have access to. In Denver specifically, there's a lot of great rooftops that are on apartment buildings or they're in office buildings that just really go vacant all the time. So we had a really big focus on doing rooftop pools so that you could rent uh, we're working on a rooftop fitness series where instead of going to a yoga studio, you can do your yoga outside, which we were planning to do before all of this. And now actually just it makes even more sense. Um, and like Jason was saying, the, the third space for restaurants has been a, a new focus of ours of where do we uh, offer space where restaurants can spill over. Um, so we're looking at a lot of that where there are larger outdoor areas for people to be able to rent out either for an event or for meetings and they can actually meet outside and have a private space that's controlled to do their Zoom meetings or do their team meetings where they're not all coming into an indoor space. Yeah, in general, private bookings right now, um, I think that's how people are kind of easing back into their social life is I can control my container by inviting 10 or 12 friends and renting a private restaurant for a night rather than going to a public location where I don't know everyone's been as diligent in, uh, in monitoring their health or whatever their, their comfort zone is. So um, lots of bookings on, on the outdoor side, lots of bookings and kind of those private space rentals. Um, so one of the pieces that you started to kind of speak to, and it sounds like um, you will in a bit in your presentation too, um, but this notion of kind of going beyond the bar or beyond, you know, sort of maybe the, the immediate things that we think about for generating income um, or, you know, making a budget work for renting out a space. Um, I know you've talked in the past about becoming a host and kind of, you know, maybe it, it is immersive arts or it's immersive experiences or experiences of any kind, but that's kind of alongside um, other elements that would be inviting folks in. Could you speak a little bit about that yeah so what we'll do is we'll kind of take you through a couple of the activations that maybe speak to um you know a bit of this concept and then we'll drill down in, into it a bit more because i really think this is how we change artists from from actually creating a service and getting paid for a service or um, a production or an experience to saying they're kind of perpetual entrepreneurs and hosts and and experienced designers in space so um, we'll walk you through kind of some some interesting activations that might get the wheels turning as far as how other people are using space. We also want to show you just some of the listings or featured listings just to get your idea and your mind going towards what could you create in certain spaces. And then we'll circle back as far as like what the future in a, in a almost like a gig economy fashion, what it looks like to be a, an entrepreneur placemaker going around and hosting and gathering and producing and, and bringing in and being that hub that brings in kind of other um, creators into a physical space. Yeah, so I'll share my screen here and we can kind of run through a few of what we are working on um, and some examples of spaces that we have activated or um, how other people are using it. What we've really tried to focus on is we want to be empowering to the entrepreneur and allow and you to use space and show you how you can use space to be a power user as we're calling it so that you essentially can divvy up your, the space that you're taking on and find com complementary uses for that space within your own community that helps support the overhead of that, uh, of that space. So Find My Zen is a, a great example. That same school we were at the auditorium in, this space here is the corner classroom. And we worked with Find My Zen, which is an uh, online uh, wellness kind of database of all the practitioners, all the classes, all the things that are happening in the wellness world and in, I think they're in eight states now or eight cities. Um, and how we work with them is that we realized from one of our own spaces that there was a ton of demand for people to come and teach wellness classwork, whether it's 
breath work or meditation or yoga or dance or whatever it was there there wasn't spaces that were available for rent for individual practitioners you could go to a studio and the studio would take a certain percentage of of the class or you were paid a flat fee on that we wanted to turn that around and put the in the entrepreneur back in the powers position so this was designed for that exact situation where find my zen was the power user on this space they took on a master lease of the room and then they worked with their practitioners to sublease that room in, in, in increments throughout the day. So they leased the space from the landlord through Reactive. They booked it a, a monthly fee, uh, I think it was $1,500. And then they broke it up into three daily rental times, morning, afternoon, and evening. And that was, I think, $50, $75, and $100 was the time. And that was a three or four hour window that any practitioner had access to that space. So really lowering the cost barrier for those practitioners where they could come in on a Monday morning for $50 and have the space for four hours to do two classes and do a drop in rate of $20 or so per, per student and potentially, you know, have 20 students in their two classes and make $400 on a $50, you know, booking. The weekends were the, in the evenings were more expensive because obviously you could get a little bit more traction with, with attendance. Um, but they basically took this space, they then, then relisted those three um, time blocks onto Reactive so that a practitioner of dance could say, hey, I really wanna teach a Wednesday evening dance course. They could go back to Reactive, book that Wednesday evening course, either just one, once, one time, or they could do it recurring where they had booked it every Wednesday and then they had a consistent following of their, of their, uh, the, their students. And they then were able to put themselves in the power position where within, before they even launched this, which unfortunately never was able to launch because of, of COVID, they had already booked out more than the $1,500 that they were out for the first month. So they were in a position where they were actually having the space almost half of the time for themselves to do their own personal activations and their own things. But all the practitioners that were renting for them were actually covering their overhead. So the, the model was built so that they could distribute those expenses. And in this case, they actually started to have a profit on that expense in addition to being able to use the space after somebody else wasn't there. Um, and then we did another piece that we're working on actually right now that's part of the COVID world where we pivoted really quickly working with the artist community, knowing that artists are struggling just like everyone because no one can come to a gallery, no one can come see their, their work and it requires you know, seeing work to sell art. So knowing that there's a lot of vacancy and we're in the vacancy business, we presented to some of our partners um, in Rhino that, hey, instead of these available for lease signs, what if we hung artists art in these spaces and we were able to actually have an exterior art show. So we could actually curate a show around a couple of block radius where people could go on their own accord and stay socially distanced and go see a dozen or so artists exhibit their work and purchase through that process. Um, and for us, it was really a concept that we wanted to execute. We were essentially put partnering with a, someone who would underwrite the cost of that and we were renting the windows at a dollar a day. So as a patron of the arts, you could essentially sponsor an, a window for 30 days for $30 and that gave access to the artists to be able to hang their work there. The artist was responsible for being able to put up their work and light the work and manage the installation of their work, but they essentially got a free place to, to, to show. Um, so that will be up for a 30 day period and our intention is that this would be something that we could ideally grow and have it be expanded potentially, potentially even beyond art. Uh, maybe there's a retail concept that has a shoppable mannequin in the window. And if you like those shoes, you can actually text to shop that, or you could call the boutique and say, hey, I love that, that bag that's in the window. And you can essentially e-shop, but you can see it in person first. So this is something that we really like because it has really low impact on the building. You know, nobody really needs to go inside. You don't have to have a lockbox but we still are creating vibrancy in the neighborhood. You're putting something in the windows other than an available sign, which allows for there to be just more vibrancy, people to have something to go do. This is right around Denver Central Market, so we were working with them where we wanted to facilitate business to the Denver Central Market and those small businesses where we're encouraging you to grab a cup of coffee or an ice cream cone or a sandwich and start there, pick up a map from that space and then go be able to tour the neighborhood. Um, can I just jump in for one second? Just thinking about that new possible ecosystem around this too. That even feels like another opportunity for immersive creators who also, I mean, 
you know, a minimum involves creating a space and setting a set and the scene. Um, and so some of the ways that actually even beyond kind of then directly renting space, that's interesting to hear kind of from real estate or these other models in which kind of that like window dressing to be actually more of an experience um, or something that just is, goes a little bit deeper um, than kind of showing the thing might be a whole nother kind of possible ecosystem for people to be working in. Yep. I think it'd be super cool to see how creative you guys could come with a diorama type installation where you actually created a, a scene or a play or some sort of interactivity in that window. And we could program something around that in a single neighborhood where you actually got to go see a, a number of different theater experiences through a window where there was a presentation of almost mime-like presentation or it easily could still be done in sound through speakers. So that's just... A, we think that the window space is always going to be there even as we emerge from this that there's always vacant windows and i'm just really excited about how we can utilize those to create a, you know an artist outlet cool. Super cool yeah so we're going to take you through a couple of spaces here i mean the, the idea of just for those two scenarios as well as seeing some of the spaces is you know how can we start stripping away some of those barriers as, as creators and an artist um that you know it's hard to find a place to produce and what we're trying to do is make that very accessible so hopefully kind of some uh some of those case studies and seeing what's going on around town and thinking about just a vacant window space and looking at some of the, the spaces we're, we're going to show you here will will help you kind of get the idea uh rolling as as far as how how you would create and what you would create in this space and this, this is a, a very large warehouse space that we, we really like because of the scale of it. So in a time where we can't only have so many people per square foot or in a space, this is a 15,000 square foot warehouse. You have a massive space. You know, when this first started, Jason and I were talking about how you could do some sort of event that was essentially built like a chessboard where you were only allowed to be on every other square. And that became sort of an, an interactive play within either it was an art show or it was just a way that you could keep separation between people, but allow for them to be all in the same space, whether it was there was live music there or there was a, a play or a music or what, you know, whatever it could be this space is large enough that you could really activate something and continue to keep people separated from each other within a distance. Um, this next warehouse is also a very interesting one, um, right off of downtown, very raw, very big warehouse. There's actually two of them there where they could actually be two different experiences happening um, in a great space neighborhood wise because it's very industrial. So, you know, there is no sound constraints. There is no neighbors to, to you know, frustrate with any sort of noise or any sort of gathering specifically basically after 6 p.m. and on Friday and until Monday morning there's just nobody in this whole area because it is just industrial workspace so it allows for a lot more flexibility without having a neighborhood to have to worry about so we have a lot of this where it's you know there's obviously high traffic and there's value for the high traffic side of things but there's also value on the low traffic side of things that is very industrial and very raw you know, these, these landlords are not concerned about any damage being done to their building because it's just a big concrete shell. So it allows for just a little bit more open uh, creativity since you're not concerned about making noise or, or breaking something or making a mess because it's just, you can hose it out when you're done if you'd like. Uh, on the opposite side, this is a high traffic location in Tennyson. There's three houses that are a perfect reactive uh, example. A developer had purchased these to turn into condos. Um, he was intending to tear these down, you know, potentially as early as the summer before COVID happened. Now COVID has happened. He stopped the, the pro project altogether and is just going to wait for it. So we have three homes in a row right on a high traffic uh, shopping district in Tennyson. These spaces are all completely raw and similar. They're going to be torn down at some point in the next year. So we have kind of a free reign of you can't really mess anything up because these homes are being torn down. So we've been talking to graffiti artists about how we could paint the whole exterior of the home, talking to lighting design people, how we could light it up with LED lights like a Burning Man art car and really start to make this vibrancy in the neighborhood instead of a blight. And right now it's overgrown with weeds and it's becoming a blight in the neighborhood surrounded by a chain link fence. It's not welcoming. It doesn't add anything to the neighborhood at all. It actually detracts from the neighborhood. So how can we come into a space like this and turn it into something that is a benefit instead of a, instead of a negative? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we showed you a small example of the really small, you know, a, a window storefront, a vacant window storefront and, you know, 12, 15, 20,000 square foot warehouses that are completely raw. Um, you know, part of the reason we're presenting this and then giving you the, some of the ideas of, of what we're doing and how we're activating is, is we really want to unleash the artist community onto, you know, community and, and commercial real estate here in Denver. So we think there's a huge opportunity to turn, you know, each vacancy and each window that you see that's covered right now into something that's really engaging and, and really delighting for the entire community and adding really vibrancy into some of these vacant spaces. So, you know, um, the, the last one we have for you and the last idea we have for you is kind of uh, circling back on that Find My Zen example. And it's how can we move from being an artist to being, a, you know, an entrepreneur or placemaker? And what does this look like financially? And so we gave you kind of a base example of, of what we're looking at for uh, placemaking and and for for hosting as an experience designer and that's you know here's uh, the um, foreign form I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this building on the outside it's in the heart of Rhino two doors down from Denver Central Market it's a beautiful sp space newly remodeled so in this situation um, we know that there's there's a base rent that can be had for three thousand dollars a month so you know and Jenny we talked about it briefly you know, before, if you don't really have a budget, how can you actually start building something that, that allows you to, to still create and cover your overhead? So um, in this scenario, if you got a $3,000 a month booking for the foreign form space, how can you fragment that down, charge a premium for those smaller utilization, give yourself a profit and a lot of space for free, essentially. So this would be something that the upstairs is gorgeous. We know that there would be office tenants to pop in and have conferences and do offsites during the day because of the proximity and just um, how gorgeous the, the, the space is. So we know that would generate probably about $750 a month. Uh, then you look at a couple of private rentals on either even people that just want have to have their friend group or a birthday party or they want to use the space for just a small private rental for 15 or 20 or 30 people. Um, we know that you can generate that for another $1,500 a month. That, that space probably goes for about $750 a day um, for those types of, of rentals. You then look at how can you to use the space in the morning when when you're not really activating it for your own your own use. Well, bringing a yoga instructor, just like Tim was talking about, uh, using the the rooftop patios. How do you take a yoga instructor and they pay fifty dollars per class to use the space in the mornings at seven a.m. and eight a.m. because of the prime location and and the space itself to generate you know maybe at two hundred and fifty dollars for for the the month. And then we know that there's kind of these, these retailers that, that go to all the pop-up markets around town. And we're even getting a lot of farmers that are deciding, I don't want to do the, the typical big farmer's market. So how do I use this as a place for a pop-up farmer's market for people that are selling their, they're doing a trunk show or selling the retail items. And we know that, that that can generate something like $500 a month. So when we look at this, you know, these are just very rough numbers and not using the space, you know, for more than maybe 20 or 25% utility that's already covering your costs of the $3,000 a month, which then allows you to use the other 75% of the time to actually be a creator, work through your experiences, rehearse, produce, create, whatever that may be. So um, that's an example of, of how we're trying to kind of re-engage the artist and the entrepreneur spirit back into commercial real estate um, because for far too often, it's been large institutional REITs owning property and chain restaurants or publicly traded companies renting and everyone else is kind of sitting on the sidelines as a consumer and, and we want to really re-engage them as a as a creator yeah i think our, our our largest goal with space is just how do we empower the creative community and, and the community overall to take to take the space back and do things just like this knowing that there's demand for private offices, knowing there's demand for private events, how can you use a space with that in mind and lease a space with the foresight to say, hey, I'm going to take the risk on this to be able to take the overhead, but it's not a risk on a five-year triple net lease. It's a month to month. So if it doesn't work after the first month, you, you can step away from it. But if it does work after the first month, you've been able to generate a business for yourself as well as be able to create opportunity for other entrepreneurs. You know, Jason Retton says about the farms, 
I've been speaking with a lot of farmers because they are, they're not probably going back to a lot of the farmers markets this summer. And one big initiative that I've been working with them on is how do we actually bring the farm goods to the people instead of you having to go to a farmer's market and walk around in the day. Well, there's, where do we have spots where there's high density of residential, but there's not a good market nearby. Um, we have that example happening right now in Lohi. Coffee shop is operating their coffee shop from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. We have a farmer from Greeley who has a CSA program that was looking for a, a location in Denver where they could do pickups because they can't afford to do the delivery. It doesn't make financial sense to deliver all over Denver. So they're actually going to lease the space for four hours a week from the coffee shop owner after she closes at 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. And that is the time when any of their CSA subscribers can come by and pick up their box as well as they'll have an open farm stand for any passerby. And we're really excited about that one because I think it provides a, a, a min, amenity to the neighborhood as well as created revenue for the, the coffee shop owner. And it's, it's a very low overhead for the farm. I think they're paying $150 a day for the four hours. And while that's not a huge amount, that ends up being $600 a month for her, which is you know almost 20 to 25% of her overall monthly lease costs. So she's actually getting a pretty decent amount of money coming back to her to help support her cost as a business. And she's not being put out whatsoever. They come in when she's not being there in the first place. So scenarios like this are what we're really interested in. How do we help facilitate the playbook on here's a really cool space. Our interest is getting it activated. How can we help show people that this is how this can be done? You have a community of, your, of yourself that somebody might need office space or someone's a jewelry designer and maybe they get that just on Saturday and it's even just a profit share with them. You know, they come in, they get a free place to, to showcase their space and you get a percentage of whatever is sold that day that helps support that. And for us, it becomes, uh, allows us to have a more robust marketplace where you're booking a space through us to begin with for a monthly basis. And then you're using reactive, you know, another dozen times during the month to book it out for a private event or for the pop-up shop or for an office. So our, our system actually gets more use by one user than creating a, another dozen bookings a month, which helps facilitate. Now we have more options for people on the website. Maybe someone's not ready to take the $3,000 a month down, but they definitely are interested in do, uh, doing a craft pop-up on a Saturday. Um, we're just creating those, those wider array of options for them. So we, we know we threw a, a lot out there, but we're also really interested to hear a bit about, you know, everyone in, in, in this conference and, you know, what are the barriers to entry? Um, you know, obviously not knowing the rules of engagement right now make, uh, make it kind of difficult, but how can we help? What are the questions? Um, you know, I, I don't know, Jenny, is there, there questions in the chat that you'd like to go ahead and cycle through? Um, there are not now, but I would like to throw that out as an invitation to everyone. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, um, so there's a couple things that we'll probably go through, but any questions that you have, like however tactical that you want to get, um, these are guys who, you know, from sort of all dimensions um, could probably get you some really good answers. So please take advantage of that. Yeah, also, I think our interest is just better understanding what what is a perfect space, like some of these questions I prompted here is just, you know, what, as we are finding spaces, I would love to know what is an ideal for you. Is it that raw warehouse where you have a completely blank canvas to create, then you don't have any noise? Is that perfect? Or is the high foot traffic a little bit better? And we're just interested to understand from the immersive community, you know, how can we serve you better within the, the properties that we're onboarding and which ones are going to work best for what you guys are working with? Yeah, and I, I think we also want to put out there that we, we know which landlords really are wanting to promote vibrancy and really want to be on your side. So, you know, and, and we even have donors that would be interested in contributing to something that adds vibrancy to a community. So as you're ideating and wanting to create something, if the barriers to entry are space or, or money, um, you know, we'd love to hear about those ideas. And, and I, I feel pretty comfortable that there's probably a space or two I have in mind that we could probably get donated for a weekend activation or something like that. So, you know, as, as you, peruse the website or think about what you're wanting to create right now. Um, we want to make sure that we circulate our contact information and hear back from you guys as far as like, I'm really looking for this. Can you help me out? And I think we can kind of add a lot of value in that scenario. So I can share at least the results of the when do you anticipate producing live in-person events poll um, that David threw out earlier. Um, so we've got nobody who 
said that they do it next month. So that's good, probably. It gives us some time to plan <laughs> uh, and think through all of this new information. Um, and then from there on out, everything's about split. Um, we've got 27% um, thinking this summer, you know, some kind of event, surely with safety precautions, with social distancing, you know, all the things that we're gonna have to think about. Um, but, you know, getting back out there this summer, um, additional 20% fall, same thing for next year, uh, and then about a third of folks just aren't sure yet, which of course with everything going on makes sense too. Um, I agree that it makes sense. I also, and this is the entrepreneur in me, that's like, we realize that the game has changed and there's certain um, requirements that we have to adhere to in protocol and we want to be responsible, but this is a time right now where there's really not that many lines in the sandbox and true creator as an artist is, is really what revitalizes uh, a community and what can allow people to kind of overcome this type of trauma and, and this type of um, fear is true artists coming out and creating. And that doesn't mean you, you can't be responsible. Um, it doesn't mean that you just have to say, you know, you don't need to wear a mask when we're jamming people in a place. It means you have to be even that much more creative as far as what you're creating within the guidelines of proper protocol. So, you know, maybe, maybe that's a little bit of a challenge to everyone. I, I wanna see art and creativity that brings people you know, together. And I realize that a lot of people aren't doing their summer travel and they're really yearning for more connection, more creativity. So I'd like to see that pull switch and, uh, and be a little top heavy on, on next month or the month after, um, knowing that that's just what heals a society. Well, one thing about immersive arts in particular that's been on my mind as out here in Milan, you know, things kind of reopening up. It's so bizarre at, you know, whatever age all of us are each at um, to be finding a, yourself in a society that's renegotiating literally the social contracts. And, you know, we all grew up into a certain norm um, that now just kind of how we interact with people on the street, in public, in public spaces, in private spaces. Um, is completely shifting and that's something that's been on my mind a lot for immersive in particular and where i think you know what this community has to offer is so important is because sort of thinking through that of thinking through you know how do you bring people into a space you know in the, in the traditional immersive context and there are rules there is a culture but you kind of pick it up you don't get like a rule book of hey this is the the world we're creating you build that into the experience those kinds of things feel really important as you know you mentioned healing i mean for healing for just what it means to come together and have to in an emergent way right just kind of ground up way um be crafting these new ways of engaging with each other so well, we know that it's going to be smaller groups. We know it might be distanced. We, we know it might be no touch, but I'll tell you from Archipelago's standpoint, uh, they're creating every single week. We're producing some sort of programming or, or content or uh, small offsite out, outdoor gatherings. I mean, it's happening and I think it needs to happen for, for people to, to kind of recover here. So I'll say it's for everyone here. Thank you again. It's your last chance for questions. If you want to throw one in there, I think we can have time for that. Um, in the meantime, I've got one for you too. Um, just what are, if you had to just list out a few of the key questions that artists should be asking themselves or kind of know that they should be ready to ask or, or answer um, if going into, you know, some sort of rental, um, you know, thinking about, using rental space. What are some of the things that should be at the top of their minds? You've mentioned so far, I mean, that the, the business owners probably want to know about liability is one of the big ones. And conversely, an artist probably might want to ask about noise or any kinds of restrictions there. Are there other key ones like that that you think makes sense to just work on? No, I, I think that comes naturally in the booking process. It comes naturally in, in negotiating with a landlord. You know, I, I'm more so on the camp of, you know, don't, don't create so many barriers in your mind of what a landlord's going to ask and why they wouldn't like this idea. I mean, we're at a time right now where um, people are saying yes and they don't know what to do with their space. So uh, I would say, you know, there's no need to pay, play devil's advocate and work through what a landlord might say because right now the city's open for business. So 
Um, it's worth having a conversation. It's worth engaging and saying, here's my idea. I don't really have a budget. I'll do a profit share. I've got a couple of other people that will rent the space. Uh, it's going to be a, an added vibrancy to your retail center. I mean, retail works when there's one vacant building that's boarded up. The other three ancillary and adjacent buildings have a drop in value and a drop in, in um, patronage just because of the fact that it's it's sitting there and it's vacant and it, it looks like it's going to be vandalized. So know that you have some power in that conversation and bringing vibrancy and something interesting in the space adds value to the entire neighborhood, to the entire building. So, um, you know, De Denver's open for business right now. We're talking to a lot of landlords that are very large and the, the conversation's changing and it's in the favor of the artist and the creator. Yeah, the, the one thing I would say too is just continue to think creatively within your own communities of if you were to divvy up a space and have additional revenue streams, think creatively on what those could be and who do you know that, that needs space or is looking for an outlet for their product and how could you partner with them? I think, you know, community is, is the value that we all have and the community is going to be more the even bigger value now. So how could you work with the people that you already know and trust in order to do something like this that would benefit all parties involved? Yeah, that was one thing I heard in that last case study that you showed us too, that kind of community strengthening, which could start with your your individual community or maybe the, you know, something around the ideas that you're interested in to generate some kind of network like that, which feels really exciting. For sure. There's yeah. there's 24 hours in a day, 168 in a week, find ways to to monetize each each hour of that. And then it's uh you know, real estate starts getting really cheap. So um, that's what we're trying to do. We want it approachable for everyone. We want people to be able to showcase their creation. Amazing. So how can people get in touch with you? So we'll share our contact information here. I'm sure we'll circle something to all the attendees with, uh, with our information, our website and otherwise. I mean, Tim's our, our activation director. He's meeting each day with um, food truck concepts and chefs and artists and creators and looking at our inventory and, and conversing with landlords. So, you know, if, if, if everyone here, you know, had an idea and they wanted to engage, Tim's going to be a great point of contact to say, here's what I'm thinking. Do you have complimentary users? I mean, we'll find the farmers, we'll find the, the chefs that want to partner with your concept when you're not using it. So um, please feel free to reach out. We're a new business. We started in November. Um, we don't have it all figured out just yet, but we're willing to be um, super high touch and all we're trying to do here is add value. So please, um, please reach out. Yeah, I'm uh, constantly, as Jason said, working with people that have ideas and trying to find space for them. And I'm also constantly seeing space and trying to find more ideas because I only have so much. So I'm empowered by you. And if you have things that you're looking for, that's why I'm interested um, please reach out to me if you have ideas or if you have a space that would be ideal for something you're looking for. All of those spaces are available now, like Jason said. Everyone is willing to come to the table and negotiate, and that's been the best silver lining out of all of this for us on the reactive side. But I also think as a community side, there's just now more opportunity forever because the guys that used to always just say no chance are, are not saying no chance anymore. And they're actually coming to a table where they're like, oh, okay, well, I wanted $5,000 a month, but now... $2,500 a month would be an amazing win for me just in the short term because I know I'm not going to get $5,000 a month for a few months. So we just don't have the opportunity like this very often where there is such negotiability and there's such an importance and vibrancy to, to keep, keep neighborhoods up, to keep properties from going into dilapidation. Um, and I did, Jason said this earlier in the talk, but I, I found just seeing people in this whole process, people are way more connected to their community. They're more interested in supporting local farms and local businesses, and they've seen the impact it's had to real people. We all know those real people that ran a restaurant or owned a retail store or have been impacted. So I think there's an empathy in our all of our lives that, hey, I, you know, I don't want to buy anything from Amazon anymore because I've been forced to for a couple of months, and that's the only way to do it. I'm dying to go and support a local business. So how do we create systems where within the constraints of right now, still are enabling local businesses to be able to get in front of their consumers. And I think the consumer is more eager than ever to support that business. We just have to find a way to get them connected. Yeah, and, and one other thing before I leave, and this is kind of a little bit of a soapbox thing, but uh, there's a beautiful quote by Toni Morrison that says, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. 
There's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language, and that's how civilizations heal. So there's something about like, we are in that space as artists, as creators, that um, you know, is, is where we should be working our hardest. Yeah, and the resilience to, uh, first of all, the importance of arts and kind of bringing all of this back out, I think, and just all the community pieces you, you guys have pointed to have opened up really interesting possibilities, at least to me. Well, thank you two so much for being here. That's one flaw of remote. There's no like clap, you know, <laughs> you don't get like the applause, but um, I, I think people are applauding for you. Um, Thank you really for for your time um, for going through all this with you. Okay, we're getting yeah we're getting virtual claps. So, um, for yeah we will share out. So um, oh I did want to mention the slides that you did see um, from these guys. We will well they are on the site already actually. So immersivedenver.com slash immersive espresso, but it has a hyphen. I probably shouldn't have done that, but immersive hyphen espresso. Um, and we'll make sure your contact information is on there too, so that we've got kind of everything in one place. And um, that's also where we'll have all the listings of future events. Um, so actually next week, same time, same place, um, we have another immersive espresso take back the streets edition. So still looking at space, different take. Um, that one will feature Cole and Mike Hewling of Handsome Little Devils um, with their project Joy Bomb that some of you may have experienced in real space. Um, certainly many of you in in addition virtually um, and Doug Casena um, of K Contemporary Gallery with Art Finds Us project um, so both of them looking at um, uses of, of public space and it'll be a bit kind of walk through their process you know challenges um, the things that are on their minds and navigating those worlds um, so if you don't already get the Immersive Denver newsletter you can sign up at immersivedenver.com um, that will have reminders um, and info about all of these events as we add them we've got a few lined up for the next um, few weeks at least you know through June and, and probably adding more especially as the situation changes and we want to be thinking about and getting resources out about different things. Um, for now, in the spirit of community, um, there is a performance starting actually really, really right now, uh, 7 p.m. your all's time um, at Leon Gallery. Their third annual performance art series um, is streaming now to their Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, so that's Leon Gallery. Um, thank you, Tim and Jason, again, and all of you for coming and taking your time uh, to be here as well. We hope it was helpful. Um, you can let us know any feedback always. I think most of you know how to reach us. Hello at immersivedenver.com um, works. If you don't, I'll probably jump on WhatsApp and, and Facebook room for a bit now anyway too, because it's 3 a.m. and now I am super awake and super excited <laughs> with brain filling with possibilities. So I don't think sleep's super likely immediately. But thank you too. Thank you all. Look forward to connecting with you all.